All right. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainable Mobility, Getting to 2030 with Speed and Equity uh, webinar presented by the Climate Center in collaboration with our many partners and coalition partners around the state. Uh, those of you who are signing in, uh, I want to thank you for joining us, and um, we're happy you can be here. Uh, my name is Duran. I'm a program manager with the Climate Center. I'm going to be your host and MC here today, uh, and I'll be introducing some of our speakers uh, who have got so much to share with you. We can't wait. Um, before we uh, move on, I want to go over a couple of logistics uh, and uh, share my screen with you to give you uh, a, a little bit of an update on who the Climate Center is uh, and talk a little bit about what we're going to hear here today before I turn it over to our first speaker. So this is indeed a webinar presented by the Climate Center. This is part of our Climate Safe California webinar series, and the topic today is sustainable mobility. Let me tell you a little bit about the Climate Center, just so you know who we are and what we do. Uh, the Climate Center is a 20-year-old nonprofit whose mission is speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. A lot of people know us for the work uh, that we've done in promoting and, uh, and uh, bringing uh, community choice energy uh, to California. Uh, we worked here in Sonoma County, where we were originally founded uh, and helped create Sonoma Clean Power in coalition with businesses, nonprofits, and government. And we're proud that there are now 24 CCAs serving 88% greenhouse gas-free electricity to over 11 million Californians. That's a huge win for the climate, uh, and it's a huge win for local control over energy. But as we know at the Climate Center, it's not nearly enough. It's not enough to clean up our electric grid. We need a comprehensive suite of policies to address the climate crisis at the necessary scale. What does that mean? Uh, that means we need a campaign that we call Climate Safe California, which is a campaign for rapid decarbonization. It's a pathway to net negative emissions by 2030 through a combination of reduction of emissions and increase in natural sequestration. Our goal is that by 2025, California will have enacted the bold policies required by science to dramatically reduce emissions, start drawdown, and secure resilient communities by 2030, inspiring global action. We ask you to join over 1,100 organizations, elected officials, CEOs, businesses, and individuals like yourselves who've endorsed Climate Safe California. I'm going to ask my colleague Nina to drop a link into the chat right now that will enable you to quickly and easily add your name to that list. And we would actually like to challenge the people here to add 30 more endorsements to Climate Safe California before this webinar is over. We believe you'll agree with us if you're here that this uh, comprehensive suite of policies is indeed something we need here in California, and we can only do it by working together. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, that attention to Climate Safe California. We have a series of additional webinars coming up. I just want to draw your attention uh, to webinar number five on natural sequestration will be on May 25th with Albert Strauss of Strauss Creamery, Assembly Member Rivas, and others. Um, and we'll be following that up with a couple of additional webinars on funding climate action and our Climate Safe California Policy Summit. We hope you'll all attend later this summer. Of course, none of this would be possible without our many promotional partners and sponsors. So I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge and thank all the people who made this work possible. That includes Renewable America, Enphase, the good folks at Jackson Family Wines who will be presenting at our upcoming sequestration webinar. Uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District will be hearing from Tin Lee here today from the Air District. Uh, thanks also to Soylent Company that actually crush up old toilets and make road base. Uh, Willow Creek Wealth Management, MCE Clean Energy, Peninsula Clean Energy, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, also Sunrun, River City Bank, and Terra Verde Energy, all of which have provided financial support to make our work here today possible. I also want to thank our many promotional partners who helped get the word out. That includes Better World Group. We'll be hearing from Ruben a little bit later today. Actera, Grid Alternatives, the good folks at ZEV2030 who share our goal of 100% zero emission vehicles by 2030. Community Environmental Council, Local Government Commission, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, California League of Conservation Voters, Clean Coalition, Climate Resolve, Drawdown Bay Area. I think you get the point that this is a broad coalition that, uh, that is much stronger, 
with more members in it, and which is why we ask you to join us in our work. Once again, you can find out more information about all these things at our website, theclimatecenter.org. So thank you once again for being here. Um, I want to take a moment now to introduce our first speaker, Assembly Member Phil Ting. Uh, and I see you here. Thank you so much for joining us, Assembly Member. We're glad you could join us. A couple words about you. Uh, Phil Ting uh, was elected to the State Assembly in 2012. Uh, you see the Golden Gate Bridge behind him because he represents the west side of San Francisco, as well as northwestern San Mateo County. Assembly Member Ting serves as chair of the Assembly Budget Committee. You've done a lot of good things for people and the environment over the years, uh, Assembly Member. We thank you for that. Uh, your work with the San Francisco Solar Task Force, your work to advance electric vehicles, including your Clean Cars 2040 legislation that we've been supporting since you first introduced it years ago. You've also done work to help students obtain Cal grants, increase healthy food access, combat homelessness, and so much more. So in honor of all of that, we thank you for your time here. We have about 20 minutes for conversation and Q&A. So I'll turn it over to you. And thank you again for being here, Assembly Member Ting. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for all the years of support around clean transportation. I think we're at a, a very exciting time, but I think we're also at a very uh, scary time. Uh, we have huge opportunities and, and we all know the stats. We know that 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from uh, transportation and 80% of that transportation is really around passenger vehicles. And so we know if we don't make progress around passenger vehicles, we're really not going to make any progress on our greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, and if you factor in oil production, it's 50% of that number. So obviously we are looking to make uh, significant investments in clean transportation, but um, let's, I think we need to remember what our, what our goals are. Um, we had a goal of getting to 1.5 clean vehicles uh, by 2025, 5 million clean vehicles by 2030. Uh, the governor just issued his executive order of 100% ZEV passenger cars by 2035 and 100% ZEV medium and heavy duty fleets by 2045. So these are, these are amazing opportunities. These are great signals that us as a state uh, have really been able to put forward, especially a state as large as California. We are the fifth largest economy, uh, largest state population wise, uh, 40, million, 40 million residents. And so I think this is really uh, an opportunity to celebrate the progress that we've made, but uh, I still continue to be concerned every single day about whether or not we're gonna be able to make that full uh, transition. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to see the automakers finally start releasing cars that people uh, are interested in buying. And what I mean by that is um, what we've seen in terms of clean vehicles is primarily sedans being released. Uh, as, as you all know, most people are buying minivans and trucks and SUVs, and we really haven't seen uh, very, very many uh, opportunities or offerings in those segments. And so I think now we have this huge opportunity as car companies, whether it's Ford or Volkswagen or Volvo, and obviously Tesla has been the, been the leader, uh, but, but Tesla are really offering uh, different types of models that are more popular uh, with consumers. I think we are really going to see a huge um consumer shift. And so what, what can we do to make sure that that shift really occurs? I think one is making sure that there's the right amount of charging infrastructure. Uh, the governor has a very large uh, $1.5 billion uh, electric charging proposal in the budget. Uh, I've been advocating for the PUC to move faster on you know, SDG&E, on uh, PG&E, as well as SoCal Edison's charging uh, charging infrastructure pilots. I think those are huge opportunities. You have private companies willing to put up private capital to help us um, expand the charging infrastructure and those are great goals. Um, I think it's really important to, to remember that electricity and um, our energy grid is gonna be 100% renewable by 2050. And so as we shift to electricity, there's always this discussion of, oh, uh, it doesn't matter if we shift to electricity and it's not clean. It's like, well, of course that does matter, but electricity even right now is cleaner than going with gasoline. And so um, as we shift and green that um, system uh, and we have 100% renewable energy for our electrical system, uh, I think it means uh, even, gives us even more reason to wanna do that transition. Um, but, uh, you know, right now, the, the discussion and the debate is uh, frankly fraught with peril. I think big oil is not going to go down without a fight. 
um, they see what's happening. I really noticed a change in the tenor around uh, electric vehicles. When I first started in 2013, it was very easy to get electric vehicle uh, legislation uh, passed. Uh, but starting about two, three years ago, anything that had anything to do with electric vehicles, there was just no way to, to move it at all. Um, in fact, I worked with environmental groups um, to push a, a study proposal uh, and it couldn't even get a hearing in Assembly Transportation Committee. And so um, the oil industry is definitely aware of what's going on. Uh, they are, are fighting. And I think if we are not smart as a community and, and realize the kind of resources they have, and really the, their, their desire to kind of fight, uh, fight with us that um, we're, we're, we may not be able to make that full transition. I mean, we've, I think many of us have watched, um, you know, watch the death of the electric car with the GM EV1. Um, and I think we, we are, are well past that at this point, but I don't think we are completely out of the woods. And so I think this is really, um, this is really a major, major opportunity. I, I think, I think there are, are, major, major pieces. One is our automakers um, doing their part and transitioning to electric. I think they've talked about it. Um, and, and while they, they've talked about it and what they've said publicly has been great, we saw even when there was a hostile administration uh, in Washington that they were at times schizophrenic. You know, G GM would say they're going fully electric, but at the same time, uh, GM would not stand with us as we were trying to fight back against Trump around the cafe standards. Um, and so we want, we want to make sure that we hold all these automakers accountable, uh, continue to push them. Uh, I think they're moving electric because of much of the regulatory work that we've done as well as much of the policy work. Um, they know that if we uh, adopt these rules in California, we, we are a significant amount of the U.S. population, and plus we're a huge uh, buyer of vehicles, and so they know that if they really want to do business in California, uh, this is sending a very, very strong signal. So we have the automakers. I think we have to make sure that we can provide enough electricity. Um, there's constant pushback on whether the grid can handle it, whether the whether the electricity is clean. So we talked about making sure that we have clean electricity. We are making sure that we are doing everything possible to expand the grid, expand the infrastructure around electricity to really um, be able to incur the huge amount of demand that is coming. And, and then lastly, it's around educating consumers. You know, people, people don't like change. It's so funny. Everybody talks about how they love change and no one likes to change. People love to do the same old, same old. And so uh, when they're familiar with the brand, when they're familiar with the type of car, they really continue to um, follow, follow on that path. So it's really trying to, trying to figure out how we can move uh, consumers because some of their habits uh, will have to change. So instead of uh, going to a gas station, you have to remember to plug your car in at night at home. And if you don't have a charging station at home or don't have access to a charging station at home, it's trying to figure out how we have enough um, infrastructure on the streets to make sure that it's very convenient for you to charge your vehicle. So, um, you know, that, I think that gives you a pretty broad overview, I think, where we're at. I think it's a very exciting time, but I really want to just urge you and, and all the folks watching to, uh, we have to remain vigilant. We, this is still a major, major fight. And this is similar to, to climbing a mountain. Uh, for all of you who do mountain climbing, you, you know that, um, that, you know, the first mile is a lot easier than the last mile. And I think as, as you get higher and higher up, the air is getting thinner. And I think we are starting to reach altitude where we really haven't been. So I think it's exciting. But I think we have to remember how much energy, how much work we have to put forward to really uh, reach that last mountain, to reach the mountaintop. And I have full confidence that we can, we can get there. Uh, I'm so excited about all the different options coming out and really the infrastructure and the planning that we are doing to make this a reality. Uh, so I can't wait to really uh, see that full transfer information, whether it's in 2030, 2035, or 2040. Uh, I think it's just an amazing, amazing time, and I can't, can't wait for, for it to get here. So let me, let me just stop here. I want to make sure I take time for people's questions and, and would love to kind of hear what people are thinking and happy to, happy to try to get to people's questions. Thank you, Assembly Member. Though that that's a great overview, and really appreciate uh, all of your comments and all the hard work you've done. We do have a, a number of questions and more coming in all the time, uh, so I'll just ask them uh, and, and name the person who asked, and then you can address them. So you mentioned electricity generation, and, and and someone asked that question specifically. Perhaps you could address it a little more. Is there concern about electric generating capacity to keep up with the shift for EVs? Something we hear a lot. Robert Brent asked this question. 
I'm wondering what your thoughts are about both the capacity and the cleanliness of the electricity. Yeah, so I think that's a typical oil industry response to, to really say that. But uh, I, I think, you know, I'd have a lot more concerns about where we're going to get oil from than if we can generate enough electricity. Um, we got plenty of sunlight. We got plenty of tidal power. Uh, we got plenty of, uh, you know, different way. We got plenty of wind. I think we have plenty of natural ways we can continue to generate electricity. I, I think the big question is around battery storage. Um, the big challenge with many of the renewable uses is do we have the ability to store um, store that power and use it when it gets dark or when there is no wind. And I think absolutely. I mean, the you know, we are hopefully, I'm knocking on wood, on the cusp of major uh, game-changing battery technology breakthroughs. I mean, just remember, we're using lithium technology in our cars that's almost as old as the internal combustion engine. I mean, this is old technology. It's not, there's nothing new. And I think if we can move towards solid state and you see companies like QuantumScape really out there just about ready to, to make a breakthrough, it'll be game changing, you know? And just for example, if you can move to a solid state battery, it means you can charge your battery in minutes, not hours. You can have a much larger range. The cost will come much further down. And imagine I, I have uh, solar panels on my home. All of us who have solar panels on our home, if we have a battery that goes with it, so we, uh, we don't need the grid at 7 p.m. at night, we can just you know, use the battery uh, because of the extra energy we produce. I think, I think this is really where we're going, we're going on the future, but also on a much larger scale. We're gonna need storage on a, on a large, uh, large commercial scale as well. Excellent, uh, good, good, good response. And certainly I agree uh, with everything you said. Um, Here's another question from Abby Drood that actually cuts directly to what some of our speakers later are going to be talking about, but we're curious to hear your take on this assembly member. What measures is the state considering to ensure that there's equity and environmental justice during this consumer shift to, to Zevs? I like to say, we don't just want Teslas for tech bros. It's got to be more broadly distributed. What are your thoughts on that and what is the state doing? I think it's a great question. I think it's, it's always a challenging question, right? But if you think about every kind of technology, whether it's a personal computer, whether, I mean, remember when calculators were expensive because those were new inventions, um, whether it's cell phones, iPads, it always starts off with there are early adopters and early adopters tend to be a little bit wealthier just because they have the resources to early adopt. Uh, and if you look at from a strategy even around solar, we incentivize those early adopters uh, they move, they buy and create, start to create this market. We start getting momentum, the costs come down and then more and more people can adopt. And so I think that's gonna be similar. For, for many folks in lower income communities, people forget there's such a focus on the clean vehicle rebate program and new cars benefiting a certain income bracket. Well, don't forget people who are low income or working, working class folks, they don't buy new cars, they buy used cars. And you can't buy a used car until you have a mature car market. So until you have cars that are three, four or five years old, you don't have a used car market. And so now that we have starting to have used cars, and, and again, many people don't want to buy the earlier version of the Nissan Leaf, which only went 80 miles. Um, they, they, don't, they, they don't see that as a real alternative. Uh, they're waiting for the Chevy Bolt to be a, a used vehicle. They're waiting for cars that have a much larger range. So I think as we see that, uh, we are definitely pushing uh, more incentives to the used car market. Uh, there's a significant amount of investment in the clean transportation sector that's going into uh, lower income communities. Um, I think also we are looking at how we can focus on fleets because obviously the fleets that service our ports, which are next to many of these working class communities uh, are the ones that are spewing uh, you know, the pollutants in the air on the freeways. And so we're working to also figure out strategies to reduce the climate pollutants from, uh, uh, from ports and from, from fleets. And so I think it's, it's a multi-pronged strategy, but I think, um, again, when you're, when you're looking at early adoption, it, it really is early adoption generally happens in, in folks at a certain income level. And, and that's what we've seen. And this is, this is where trends are. But just like with cell phones, there's a time when only certain people had cell phones. Now cell phone prices are, are at a point where everybody can have a cell phone. And I, say, I think that's, that's really um, where we'd like to go. I think where we are going. Well, thank you very much. I certainly agree about the used cars. And as we're starting to see that market start to expand, uh, waiting for some of the longer range EVs to get into the used car market. And some of our speakers later, uh, Abby and the others are interested in this topic, will be addressing some innovative programs, both here in California and elsewhere. Uh, speaking of elsewhere, we got a question from Andy Schrader 
and, and this is something I certainly feel. I, I wrote a white paper some years ago at the Climate Center calling for an end to ice car sales, combustion car sales in 2030. Uh, the state of Washington, as you probably know, Assembly member, uh, recently passed legislation phasing out ice cars in 2030. City of Berkeley is pushing for 2025. Norway came up with 2025, and they're already halfway there. Uh, so why 2035? Uh, why do you think the governor picked 2035? Is that soon enough? And what can we do to accelerate that timeline? I, I think it's a great question. I think a lot of it is uh, dependent on, on the automakers, right? It's like we could have a goal where we could transition tomorrow, but frankly, there aren't enough cars. And so um, I, I think the governor picked that time frame because he thought it was uh, realistic and achievable. It's something that we could do. It, it mirrors um, uh, very much the, pro, you know, the direction that England, uh, France, other countries were doing. I, I think it is great to be more aggressive. And I think if we saw um, more progress uh, being made, whether it's uh, charging infrastructure or vehicles, uh, I think we would move that time frame up. But ultimately, it's it's something out of our control, which is it's up to automakers. Uh, if automakers aren't producing enough clean cars or having options, uh, we can't say, oh, Californians can only buy or, or access two percent of the of the market. That, that that really wouldn't be a very feasible uh, strategy, and I think that would really frustrate our citizens, and I think would really hurt, hamper our transition. Excellent. Thank you so much. We got time for a couple more questions here. So um, there's a, several questions around the quest around the issue of chargers. Uh, 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 for example, uh, what's being done to encourage gas station owners to install chargers? Another person, Elena, uh, mentioned frustrations she had with poor quality chargers not working on a recent road trip she took. So both in terms of expanding charging infrastructure and ensuring that those chargers are equitable. And also this frustration a lot of people have with multiple different types of charging ports, CCS versus Chatmo versus Tesla. Is there anything happening at the state level to try to harmonize that and to accelerate that? Could talk more about the rollout of charging infrastructure. Yeah, I, I don't know if we're gonna harmonize the type of charger. I think that will naturally shake itself out. I mean, uh, I mean, for, for those of us who are old, remember the old VHS versus Betamax uh, you know, debate? I mean, we have Android phones, we have iPhones. And so I think there, there's always a little bit of that, but you obviously wanna make sure that there's enough infrastructure for everybody. Um, I, I, think, I think it is uh, an important point. The, the PUC early on, and this is, I was very, very frustrated with this decision, or early on shut the um, IOUs out of the charging game. And I think we were really hurt by it because what you have is you have a large number of startup companies in there. They're not very well capitalized and they're just starting up. Um, developing this technology. And so, uh, you know, is some of it, sometimes it works, most of the time it works, sometimes it doesn't. So Le Electrify America, remember, Electrify America is something that came out of a lawsuit. It wasn't, it wasn't that Volkswagen decided they were going go, go into this business. Uh, it came out of a lawsuit. And, and so I, I've, had this, I've had the same experience as Elena. I, I have a Chevy Bolt. I have to charge it all the time. Um, and, it's, and it really does feel like every other Electrify America charging station works versus I would say EVgo or the charge point fast chargers seem to be much more reliable and I, and I don't know why. But, but again, um, you know, while not everyone likes the IOUs, um, people like SMUD more or their LADWP, I think there's a reason why the, the larger companies or the entities have an opportunity to really build this infrastructure and they have a lot more capital. They have a lot more resources, they have a lot more electricians, um, they have a huge ability. So I'm really looking more, I'm looking forward for them to really get into the game and to, in my opinion, to go uh, raise that bar. But, but I think we've done an amazing job given that we've had a smattering of companies, you know, like the charge points, like the EVgos, really be pretty, pretty successful. Uh, as startups, and I, I, I really hope that they're going to continue to be able to grow as well. Um, there's nothing legislatively from a quality control point of view. Uh, I think the time that we would get involved is really around fraud. So if, if for some reason they, they, they charge you money and they didn't deliver the product, then we might get involved. But I think we have a hard time um, making sure that some product works. That really is you and the company that you're buying. Uh, I would assume that um, you know, if, if the product's not working, you're going to go somewhere else. I, I'll, I'll use Electrify America. Uh, I, I like them. I have nothing against them. But again, I have the same experience as Elena. So then 
I start to focus on, okay, can I get to an EVgo charger or a charge point charger because I find them more reliable, especially when I'm in a place that I'm not familiar with. Perfect. So I've got one more comment and then a final question. And again, there's so many questions. I want to thank everybody. We've got dozens of questions. We don't have time for them all. Um, but uh, Andy Schrader made a follow-up comment. I'm just going to make this comment and leave it there and then go to my last question, which was, if the legislature bans ICE cars, then, the, then and I know this is something you've been working for for years, then the manufacturers will make alternatives. So there's that, there's that uh, you know, what chicken of the egg kind of situation. That the last question, and you can wrap your answer to both of these in your final answer, is given the state's goal, this is something I've been getting a lot of questions about and us at the Climate Center have been getting a lot of questions about, the loss of funding for California uh, CVRP yeah. uh, seems counterintuitive at this time. Um, a lot of people are on the waiting list. Uh, this is Rebecca Milliken asked this question. Um, uh, in, income qualified drivers may be looking at used cars. Uh, what is the likelihood of CVRP being funded again? You sit on, you're the chair, I believe, of the budget committee. So what can you tell us about uh, refunding uh, the CVRP? Well, well it's, it's a major priority for me. I've, I've carried legislation on CVRP and I think we have to really redesign the system because um, you know, why would we have an incentive program that is flat and starts and stops? That's not a really good incentive. I mean, if, if, you know, if you're a parent and you try to incentivize your children that way, you would get a horrible result. And I think, I think we've gotten the, as good a result as we can. I, I think we really need to make an upfront larger investment and then wind it down over time. You know, for example, you know, instead of 2,500, let's offer people like 7,000 today, but then you know, over five years, in five years, it's gonna be $250, right? So people know, hey, I gotta get that car now, not later. Um, I, I just slightly disagree with the comment that if we banned the ICE cars today, that we could immediately shift to EVs tomorrow. Um, car manufacturers, it takes, I think, uh, five to seven years to really redesign a car, to build a car. Um, you know, we've seen that also uh, you have many of these large automakers. They're not the most nimble of companies. Um, <laughs> they don't really change that much. And, I, and I've seen that where I, you know, I have a Chevy Bolt. I love my Chevy Bolt. But as a company, GM has done, I think, a poor job of one, selling that car, but also servicing that car and, and really being able to helping me kind of manage that car. I'll just give, I'll give you an example, like the silliest example. I went to go take it in because one of my headlights is out. Well, I, I, it, it cost me, it would cost me, I'm not going to change it. It's kind of, kind of, it would cost me $1,000 to change a headlight because they put the headlight where you have to remove the front bumper to change the headlight. Like who designs a car like that? <laughs> you know, and so you have these, these, these great things they want to design in people's minds and they're just not very practical. So I, I think that's where a, a Tesla or like a Rivian where these startup companies, they start up from ground zero making uh, electric cars, um, I think have a, have a distinct advantage even though they have a lot less money and opportunity. So, you know, really, I, I love the questions. I could be here all day, uh, but I, I really appreciate that. And I think uh, I see one question around multifamily. I think multifamily is a major issue. Uh, we do have to make significant progress around multifamily so people who live in apartments or live in multifamily buildings can get charging access to it from their home. So I think that's another uh, major hurdle that we're going to have to overcome. But thank you so much. This is great and really look, uh, really just appreciate um, the discussion and can't wait to continue this work. Well, thank you so much, Assembly Member. On behalf of the Climate Center and, uh, and all the attendees here today, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here and for everything you do in the Assembly. Uh, it's time to move on to our next panel. So. Thank the assembly member. Good luck with the Thank rest you. of your work Appreciate today. Take Go care. get more EV laws passed. <laughs> there you Go. Go. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for all the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all. Uh, perhaps some of the future speakers will be able to address some of these issues. Uh, we're going to move to our first panel. We have two panels today. Uh, this panel is on personal mobility, equity and personal mobility. We're going to have three speakers. Tin Lee from the Air District, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, Lillian Mervis from the Center for Sustainable Energy, and then Dr. Joe Liu from the Coalition for Clean Air. So I think uh, I had some preparatory remarks prepared, but I know I think we're all prepared to hear from our speakers. So I'd like to turn it over to Tin Lee now. Tin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here and uh, please go ahead. Cool, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna pull up my uh, slide real quick. All right, um, hopefully everyone can see this. Um, 
So I, I work for uh, the Air District, um, which is a, a regional uh, government agency, and our mission is to protect and improve public health, air quality, and the global climate. We're committed to advancing the cause of equity, diversity, access, and inclusion in everything that we do. An example of this is uh, through our Clean Cars for All program. And so I, I've seen a, a few questions about um, what we're doing to, uh, to help uh, low-income folks uh, get access to these vehicles. Um, so um, Clean Cars for All is a retirement replace program. Um, low-income residents who are in frontline communities can turn in their old car and get up to $9,500 uh, to purchase a plug-in hybrid, a hybrid, or electric vehicle that's eight years old or newer. Um, so this, this means that uh, folks can use these incentives to um, purchase used vehicles. Um, so that, that's an, another important topic um, that, that was touched upon by the assembly member. Um, participants uh, have to have an uh, income that's equal or less than 40% of the federal poverty level. Um, so this means that a family of four that makes under $104,000 can qualify. Um, grantees that buy a plug-in hybrid or electric vehicle can also get a $2,000 rebate to um, purchase a, a home charger. And, and we also have the option for folks who live in uh, multifamily units. Um, they can get a, a portable charger or we can give them $500 for uh, a public charge card. Ken, so, sorry to interrupt you, but we can see your presenter notes. If you could put your oh. slides on full screen, that'd be great. Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, is, it, is this better? We can still see your notes, but just keep going with it for now. We'll, we'll okay. try to work on it in the back end. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so um, in order to, uh, so, so the folks who uh, like have participated in our program, um, we, we have a picture on the bottom right um, which is uh, one of our grantees, Liz, who turned in a uh, 1969 uh, Volkswagen Beagle, Beetle. And um, she used her incentive. She got $9,500 to buy a uh, Fiat 500e. And um, she, she paid, the, I think the car was around um, 10,000 um, and some change. I think it's the, the color that she wanted and the, the, the leather trim that she wanted. Um, so she only had to pay um, about 500 or $1,000 out of pocket. Um, and she also got a uh, a rebate to um, to buy a portable charger. And so Liz Liz also was a client of, of Grid Alternatives, who, who I'll talk about next um, or, or later. Um, so she she got solar in her uh, at her house um, for free. And so you know she's charging her car um, basically for for free now. So um, and then our the, the the photo on the top right shows our first three grantees who um, have purchased vehicles. Um, the, they purchased their vehicles in, in June of uh, 2019. And since then we've um, awarded over 1700 applicants. So, and um, what's interesting is I, I know the program's called Clean Cars for All, but it's, uh, it's not just a, um, uh, it's not just a, a, a vehicle program. It's, it's, it's a mobility program. So um, Clean Cars for All also gives um, grantees uh, up to uh, $7,500 to um, get a public transit card or they can uh, purchase an e-bike. Um, and so um, the, the top left photo shows a picture of Patrick and his family. Um, and, and Patrick was the first grantee who participated in our program. Um, and so his family, um, they bought three e-bikes. We, we got them some accessories and um, any amount that they have that's remaining um, from uh, you know that's left over of the $7,500. They they get that automatically applied for um, for public transit, um, and um, you know our program is is really uh, an equity focused program, and um, you know we 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 care about access um, a lot, and so we partnered with Great Alternatives, um, who provides uh, multilingual uh, one on one uh, case support. So someone who um, who is a Spanish speaker and doesn't have access to a computer, um, they can contact GRID and they can get um, assistance applying, um, purchasing a vehicle, scrapping their, their old vehicle and, and anything really in between. Um, and then uh, finally, um, I just wanted to um, quickly mention, we, uh, the Air District's EV team um, also recently released a, uh, 
draft of our Bay Area EV acceleration plan. Um, so I'll share the link for, for that plan um, in, in the comments and um, where we're accepting comments to the end of the day. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and let me know if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. That was that was great, and we really appreciate the work that the Air District is doing. Uh, we're going to hold the questions till the end of this panel, uh, but there are questions coming in for you, so we'll address those all uh, after Lillian and Joe uh, have made their presentations. Uh, I'd now like to turn it over to Lillian Mervis from the Center for Sustainable Energy. Lillian, the floor is yours. Good morning. Just confirming everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, perfect. So good morning, everyone. Lillian Mervis with the Center for Sustainable Energy. I am here today to talk about program design opportunities to help make electric vehicle rebate programs more equitable. Just some background on Center for Sustainable Energy. We are a California-based nonprofit that does work nationally in the electric vehicle uh, transportation energy program space. Uh, we administer here in California, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project on behalf of the California Air Resources Board. We also administer the California Electric Vehicle Incentive, Pro uh, Incentive Program on behalf of the California Energy Commission. And then outside of California, we do electric vehicle rebate programs in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Oregon. For today, I'm focusing on non-California programs and just pulling out two examples where we see uh, program design opportunities that really help effectively deploy electric vehicles in low-income communities. So I'll touch upon the MSRP cap and used EV rebates. I'm going to touch upon them at a very high level just for the sake of time. And if folks have further questions, we can dig into the details during the Q&A with the other panelists. So for MSRP cap, to quickly define that, that's a cap on the price of the vehicle, the MSRP, and above that cap, the vehicle will not qualify for a rebate. So essentially, you know, Duran made a point earlier, there used to be a lot of contention, still is a lot of contention about who's buying these vehicles, is it just tech bros buying Teslas? The goal of this is to say, you know, no vehicle over, for example, $55,000 will receive this rebate. So to bring up the charge up New Jersey example, uh, the cap there is $55,000 and the incentive amount in New Jersey is very creative. It actually takes the um, EPA rated all electric range of the vehicle and multiplies it by $25 with a cap at $5,000 for the rebate. So for example, if you buy a fully EV vehicle that goes 250 miles on a charge, multiply that by 25, that gives the incentive. I know that's a funky example. That's just one of many. Um, New Jersey is not the only state that where we see an MSRP cap. Actually, all of the programs that we administer in the EV rebate space have an MSRP cap. Some will create a range where, for example, uh, 45,000 to 55,000 MSRP will have a set amount 35 to 45 and then 35 and lower. The benefit of this is it's easier to apply for a rebate without having to figure out, you know, if there's an income cap, what does that mean? You know, where am I in the income? Where am I kept at? Do I have to provide documents that show my income? You know, as an applicant, it just can potentially create uh, more paperwork. And then on the administrative side, it's a lot easier to get rebates out the door because they're basically, you know, once we see how much the vehicle costs, uh, it's just easier to approve it and make sure that the rebate, the post-purchase rebate is in the hands of the low-income consumers as soon as possible. Moving on to the used EV rebate side, I know Tin just touched upon Clean Cars for All, which does do scrap and replace, and one of the options is a used or new EV for replacing the vehicle. I'm here to talk about an example where uh, no scrap is needed, just any clean vehicle rebate program can incorporate a used electric vehicle into this model. I know Assembly Member Ting highlighted um, that there is a need to grow the used car market to have this type of rebate available. You know, as we see the programs like CVRP here in California uh, really target the middle class, really target on getting more new vehicles, new EVs into the hands of consumers that will grow the used EV market. And in fact, if you go online today to some online dealers, you can see there is a plethora of used EV 
uh, used EVs that are available that are pretty affordable. And with a rebate on top of that, they become, you know, there are some like smart cars that are $10,000. If there's a $5,000 rebate, that's now a $5,000 vehicle, uh, which is fantastic. So just to go over the example in Oregon for the Oregon Clean Vehicle Rebate Program, uh, if you're LMI, you can qualify for a new or used EV rebate. Um, LMI in Oregon has a definition that's based on location and household side, um, household size, pardon me. And like Tin said in California, we define LMI based on uh, federal poverty level. There are also examples where it's based on area median income. In Oregon, if you qualify for LMI, you can get an additional $2,500 on a new or used uh, PHEV, so a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or a battery electric vehicle, and that also has a $5,000 max rebate. In the final 30 seconds that I have, I will add these programs are going through constant evolution, constant iteration to make sure that they learn from, you know, maybe there's something inefficient on the administration side. Maybe there's something to increase the rebate for those who qualify for low income. Maybe there's a way to change the definition of low income so more people qualify. So something that's really beneficial in designing these programs is to make sure that whether it's through legislation or regulation, there's an opportunity to evolve the programs over time so that they really qualify for as many people as possible. And again, um, streamline the way to get these rebates into the hands is for those who need it most. Thank you, Lillian. That's great. Uh, it, nice timing. Well done. Uh, I want to thank you for this presentation. I mean, it really goes right to the heart of Climate Safe California, right? Speed and equity. That's, that's really what we need to be thinking about, how to get there fast and how to get there fairly. Uh, so thank you for uh, those innovative ideas. Uh, I'd now like to turn the floor over to Dr. Joe Liu from the Coalition for Clean Air. Joe, we're very happy you could be here with us today. Uh, five minutes are yours. Hi, thank you, uh, Doran. I, I appreciate it. I, I, so much has, has already been spoken about today. Um, I'd like to at least uh, go over a little bit of my, my own experience and, and what's going on uh, with Coalition for Clean Air and in my position as, as uh, uh, member of the California Transportation Commission, and we're talking about equity and personal mobility. And I guess my main point is that there's uh, personal mobility isn't just single occupancy vehicles. And, and I'll get to that. But first, I wanted to start off. You guys see the screen? Okay, I think. Um, yes. This is a letter. I, my mom grew up during the Depression. She saved everything. And thank God she did, because I came across this letter when I was cleaning out her house after she passed away. And it, dated July 29th, 1969, to her assembly member talking about the fact that they were about to take up a committee meeting on banning the internal combustion engine. 1969. And my mother was encouraging, based off her experience with engineers at, at UCLA, building uh, uh, hydrogen vehicles back then, that, you know, uh, and, and knowing that air pollution was a problem and even mentioning climate change in her letter in 1969. It's not like we haven't been talking about this stuff in the past. Uh, and my, my mom admittedly was ahead of her time, but I did want to point out since we were talking about this, that uh, um, uh, you know, this is not a new issue and something uh, in terms of uh, what we need to get at. Uh, those four or five years that, that the car companies need to turn around to electric vehicles and, and, and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles could have happened a long time ago. But let's talk about a little bit about the problems of, of uh, equity in transportation. And I wanted to share this from PolicyLink and, and USC that, that shows that African Americans, in terms of lack of access to a car in California, is about 17%. And when you look at, you know, whites, it's, it's less than 7%. And other you know, people of color also have less lack, uh, uh, less access to vehicles or cars than uh, than whites do. This is, I mean, this is an equity issue based on race, and it, of course, probably doesn't surprise us too much. And that's on the, you know, the access to transportation. It also goes to um, the adverse consequences of, you know, trans our transportation infrastructure in terms of PM two point five exposure. And this study was done by a contractor for the California Air Resources Board and shows clearly that African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asian-Americans are exposed to more PM 2.5 from on-road sources than whites are. 
And, you know, again, it's probably not too surprising when you think about it, but what we're, we're talking about in terms of inequality in transportation and the need for transportation equity is that people of color are suffering on both sides of this equation, on the access to transportation and also on the uh, adverse consequences of our transportation infrastructure. So um, I wanted to just share a couple of those slides with everybody before getting to some of my other uh, talking points. But um, I can make fun of Tesla drivers because I, I managed to buy a used Tesla right before the pandemic hit. Uh, a very great deal on a, on a 2013 Model S that I really love. Um, but you know, bumper to bumper Teslas doesn't solve our transportation and mobility needs. And uh, you know, um, while I'm glad to have the vehicle, I, we, I also need to get out of my single occupancy vehicle and everybody does if we expect our transportation system to work. It just simply can't work any other way. I grew up on the San Diego freeway. You know, I lived in, in Torrance and Culver City growing up. And um, I saw that freeway go from three lanes to four lanes to five lanes to six lanes in places. You know, it's just absolutely insane. And it's still congested like crazy. The problem of induced traffic by just building and adding lanes to freeways just doesn't work. And we've learned that lesson and we have to find something else and we have to get people out of their cars in order to do that. Now, this is a cultural thing in California. We know it's not easy or simple, but we have to make it equitable for people who take public transit, who use active transportation, they ride bicycles, they, they, they walk, and we need to do better planning. We need to have complete streets. And um, Denny Zane from Move LA has an idea of grand boulevards. We have these wonderful boulevards in every community, uh, you know, in, uh, especially suburban and urban communities in California that can be transitioned to um, very functional, uh, you know, uh, places where you can both work and live. So those are some of the issues that we, we need to deal with. And um, I, while I, I think Clean Cars for All is a wonderful program, and I, I love the idea of the rebates, um, and you know, then that's important to get people into zero emission vehicles. We also need to think about mobility more broadly in terms of public transit and active transportation and complete streets. So I'll leave it at that. I know we have a lot of questions and conversation to get to. Thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate that. And what an amazing story about your mother. I, I, I wish I could have meet, met her. She sounded like an incredible person uh, and very much ahead of her time. So I liked her a lot. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure. Um, well, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I, we do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, uh, of course, we're with so much to talk about. I don't think we're ever going to be able to answer all the amazing questions. Um, but uh, a question I have a couple questions for Tin. Uh, Tin, if you don't mind, uh, someone mentioned that they live in an apartment complex with no charging facilities, and they're curious what you were talking about when you mentioned a portable level two charger. Uh, can you clarify that for uh, for our for our attendee? Yeah, so there's there's portable chargers that it, that um, that you can plug into um, a um, a NEMA outlet, um, and so you can just take it take it and go, and it's a, a level two. It's generally they're like sixteen amps, um, so it's not a full. Uh, uh, 32 amp level two charger. Um, so there's there's a few options that are available, and I'm, I'm happy to send some information about those chargers too. Okay, that's a, that sounds good. Yeah, please share it. And I also would point out that all cars come with the level one chargers that can plug into any standard outlet and are great for overnight trickle charging. Um, so question, another question for you: uh, Will Backmud consider expanding the program to all zip codes? Um, what's the future of clean cars for all? Like Good those question. of us who missed out on it, want to know. Question. Uh, not to crack, you know, our funding um, from CARB um, is restricted to uh, disadvantaged com communities, so Cal and Virus Green communities. Um, and so the, the only reason why we were able to expand the program um, to uh, all zip codes was because we got um, Volkswagen settlement funds. And then we also put a little bit of our, um, our local funds as well. We actually put in 10 million of our local funds. So there is some opportunity, but, you know, we're, we're tracking a lot of um, data about our grantees and um the demographics and stuff like that and so we're um 
we're really focused in the frontline communities and that's why those those zip codes are, are the way that they are but there there will be opportunity i think in the future to expand those, those zip codes okay great uh so this is a question just to the panel generally and joe perhaps i would ask you to to tackle it first uh, uh this is a really good question low-income residents in la have shared uh let me see if i have the name of the person brett weinberger points out low-income residents in la mentioned the main barrier to zev purchases access to loans it's not about rebates and incentives. It's about access to financing. Um, so, uh, how can policy address this? What do you? What What can we do to to improve access to financing in low income communities uh, to improve access to these types of technologies? Yeah, that's that's important. I mean, there there are loan guarantee programs and that can be uh, used to to help low income communities with that. I mean, it's not as if you you, you purchase a a zero emission battery electric vehicle and you don't have an asset backing it up. I mean, it's there, right? It's it, um, So those those loans can and should happen, especially in a time with such low interest rates. That's also a problem when it comes to heavy duty vehicles and the expensive, clean, heavy duty vehicles, because, you know, the and, and Ricardo in the next panel can talk about this. I mean, there are real issues when the drivers are being exploited as contractors and independent owner operators and, and they, their loan uh, percentages are like upwards of 20% on a loan. And you can't put them in a clean vehicle at those kind of rates. So uh, Ricardo, can, I'll let Ricardo get to this one because he knows it much better than I do. But it's an issue not only for uh, those people trying to get passenger vehicles, but in heavy duty vehicles too. Yeah, fantastic. Another challenge for us to address. Uh, certainly we have plenty of work to do. Uh, Lillian, I've got a question for you. Uh, and this question came uh, directly from Rebecca Milliken. Uh, she wants to know, it's exciting to see used EV rebates and hearing about streamlining rebates for new cars using MSRP versus income. Is California looking at these programs as models? I mean, it's great to know stuff's happening across the border in Oregon, uh, but what about here in California? Used EV rebates, what do you think? So I'll start by saying, um on the MSRP versus income cap side, it looks like Rebecca, based on your question, you're familiar with this, but the so CVRP here in California does have both an income cap and an MSRP cap as part of the program design, which is really interesting. It's the only program that has an income cap. And what that does is if you make over a certain amount, you don't qualify for the program. Um, and with the MSRP cap, if a vehicle costs over a certain amount, then that vehicle does not qualify for a rebate. Uh, the income cap was set by the legislature in 2016. So CBRP has had that model for a while now. On the used EV rebate side, like I mentioned, uh, Clean Cars for All obviously has that model. It's an interesting time in the clean transportation program space because, and Joe can touch upon this as well, uh, the budget, you know, Assemblymember Ting talked about how CVRP did not receive any funds in the January proposed budget that may change and then may revise. Uh, there's also two policy bills going through committee right now that look at, you know, the on the infrastructure side, um, adding more equity, more funds to disadvantaged communities, creating prioritization on that front. So I know that doesn't exactly address the used EV rebate side, but there's just, there's a lot in the policy space and the legislative space that are, is looking at changing those programs. And if it's something that you're interested in, obviously the pub policy, public policy is supposed to be a public process. So um, if you're interested in those bills, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or um, Joe, I'll, I'll throw you in there because I know Coalition for Clean Air is, yeah. is pretty involved well, in those bills. Mm -hmm. we've, yeah, we've been very supportive of the uh, higher investments and clean cars for all. Uh, and that, that's really important. What the real question now is that we have a budget surplus unlike one we've seen for forever, perhaps. And so the question is, how are we going to invest that money? Uh, you know, obviously, there are other um, issues that, that need funding. But uh, investing in climate, the environment, clean vehicles is, is one of the ones that we think uh, should be used for, for um, some of that surplus. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to thank you all. We've got so many questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to address them all here live. I would ask our panelists to take a moment uh, to answer some of those questions, if you can, uh, after we move on uh, so that people can get their answers. I want to thank all of you who are asking all these excellent questions and being engaged here. I'll just mention two things before we turn to our next panel. 
But first of all, stick around for the end because one of the things that we're gonna do is give you an opportunity to take action on exactly what we're talking about here and get your toe into the legislative and budget process. Uh, so we've got an action item at the end that we're very excited about. So stick around for that. And I would also mention that Climate Safe California essentially is exactly what we're talking about, is a policy platform to drive exactly these types of equity and funding issues forward. If you have not yet endorsed, Nina, perhaps you could drop that link one more time. There, she already did it. She can read my mind. Uh, you can join. I know, I see we've already got over a dozen new endorsements. So please uh, join those people and endorse Climate Safe California. We're now going to move on to our second panel on freight and transit. Very, very, very interested to hear about uh, this very important topic. Um, and in order to introduce our speakers and frame the discussion, I want to introduce my colleague who works out of our office in Fresno. Uh, please welcome Destiny Rodriguez. Destiny, go ahead. Thank you so much, Duran. So the movement of goods accounts for a large percentage of transportation related emissions. This pervasive pollution affects some of the most vulnerable communities of color, many of whom live near the corridors being exposed to tailpipe emissions on a daily basis. Here in the Central Valley, we have the Highway 90, 99, the Interstate 5, fleet hubs, and these diesel trucks heavily contribute to air pollution, health impacts, and climate change. In the second panel, we will hear from experts who are working to prioritize equity and clean mobility to create a roadmap of opportunity of a just transition to electric transportation technologies while also prioritizing the transportation workforce and frontline communities. For our first speaker of this panel, we have Ruben Eroen from the Better World Group. Next, we will hear from Andrea Villadere from People's Collective for Environmental Justice. And closing this panel will be Ricardo Hidalgo with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. So I will have Ruben go ahead and start. Thank you. Thanks so much, Destiny. Uh, can you hear me okay? Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's so great to be with you uh, and so many other passionate clean transportation uh, experts uh, on this panel. Uh, I wanted to take a minute to just set the table of the extraordinary Earth Week that we had last week, as well as the challenges and opportunities in front of us to transition uh, not only to zero emission cars, but also to buses and trucks. Uh, as California is, uh, is setting the path to accomplish. Um, so just last week, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris visited uh, an electric school bus manufacturing plant as part of the $174 billion that the president has uh, earmarked for electric vehicle transportation and infrastructure in the American uh, jobs plan. Um, 20 billion of that would be for electric school buses uh, which is quite extraordinary uh, and critical to transition. Uh, the president uh, visited uh, the electric bus manufacturer Proterra in South Carolina. Um, not to be outdone, uh, our uh, California governor and 11 other governors uh, called on uh, the president, the administration to really prioritize the acceleration of clean vehicle transitions uh, committing to 100% zero emission vehicle light duty sales by 2035 and a uh, full uh, truck electrification buyer before 2045. Uh, as you know, the governor also called for the end of oil drilling in the state by 2045, uh, putting more uh, priority on getting on the need to transition to electric transportation. Uh, also last week, the advanced energy economy put a report out showing that there are more than 35,000 electric transportation related jobs in manufacturing, infrastructure, service economy, and that's set to double in just the next two years, thanks to California's policies and investments. That was the good news. Um, here's the crappy news that continues to plague California and too many communities across the country and around the world, especially around freight corridors. Um, for the 21st year in a row, California uh, has some of the worst air quality in the nation, according to uh, the American Lung Association. Their state of the air report uh, just came out last week. Um, people of color are three times more likely to be breathing the most polluted air um, than other communities, 
and eight uh, of our cities uh, continue to have some of the worst graves, worst air pollution in the country. One of the uh, exciting opportunities that California has leaned into uh, just last year, uh, the California Air Resources Board adopted an advanced clean truck rule uh, that will require an increasing percentage of uh, medium and heavy duty trucks and buses to, for manufacturers to meet uh, increasing percentages of ZEV sales uh, beginning in 2024. Uh, this will bring really important uh, benefits in health as well as health savings, uh, carbon reduction, pollution reduction, um, and economic investments. And my colleagues that you'll hear from in a minute were instrumental in helping ensure that CARB adopted a really impressive and strong ZEV rule that now many other states are looking to replicate as well. One of the most important elements of that rule and the complementary advanced clean fleets rule under development now is to prioritize uh, drayage uh, operations so that 100% of on-road uh, trucks at our ports, um, and we're hoping in our port adjacent uh, communities will be uh, electric by 2035. The um, board resolution for the ACT rule uh, focused on not only a requirement for manufacturers, but also for uh, setting a fleet rule, which will require uh, fleets, 50 trucks or more, $50 million or more in revenue to be required to purchase these zero emission trucks, again, starting in just a couple of years. The uh, fleet's rule uh, has three elements, a public uh, element, the uh, requirement for transitioning new purchases of public fleets to 100% uh, uh, purchases starting in 2027. Uh, as I mentioned, the drayage transition to get to on-road by 2035 means that come January 1, 2023, only zero emission trucks need to be um, uh, you know, on the uh, allowed to be on the drayage registry. That's what our advocacy coalition is um, excited about and pushing for. And then here's a quick graphic of the phase in schedule for uh, private high priority fleets um, to transition to their fleets to ultimately get to 100% zero emission trucks. And while individuals need to purchase new uh, or used electric cars, there are fewer fleets, decision makers, that actually have to make this transition in this purchase, which we think is important. All Californians deserve to breathe clean air, a complementary effort to ensure that we are investing in this future. Uh, the Charge Ahead Equity-led coalition, um, of which my colleagues are a part, is calling for investments now uh, to help accelerate these regulatory processes. You can learn more about it at investincleanair.com. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk in quick uh, thumbnail on the opportunities that heavy duty uh, sector uh, provide. And we'll turn it back to you, Destiny, to um, move us through the panel. Thank you so much for that, Ruben. So our next speaker, we will be hearing from Andrea Viradere from People's Collective for Environmental Justice. Andrea? Thank you, Destiny, and hi, everybody. Really happy to be here. My name is Andrea. I'm with an organization called the People's Collective for Environmental Justice. We're a community-based organization based in the Inland Empire of Southern California, and we're composed of impacted residents and workers that are building community and power in order to fight the legacies of environmental racism in our communities and fight also for an alternative version for what our world should look like. Um, I was raised in the Inland Empire. I've seen the way that our communities have rapidly changed right in front of us with the boom of e-commerce and what we call the convenience economy. We've seen millions of square feet of warehousing get built over the last decade right in our own backyard, taking up so much of the beautiful land that a lot of our communities cherish. Um, and it's not just happening in the IE, happening in the Central Valley, it's happening in Imperial Valley, and other parts of um, the inland areas of California. And with these millions of square feet of warehousing come thousands of diesel trucks that come into our communities, uh, that they travel to the largest port complex in the United States to store and distribute goods to the rest of the state and to the rest of the country. Um, we're what's considered a dry port, 
Um, but we don't have a port authority. Um, and instead we have cities that just compete against each other trying to attract these businesses and they kind of create this race to the bottom effect. And so we have 20,000 diesel, dr diesel trucks that drive on these freeways a day, right? And we have multiple of these freeways in our communities. Um, many of these freeways and railways have been here for a really long time, but the legacies that they were built upon, which is the legacies of environmental racism have not changed. We are still seeing the way that the transportation and logistics industry is building out in communities specifically of color. And we recently did a study, we're really proud of it, done by students and community members with GIS technology, Cal virus screen uh, data and warehouse locations. And we found that of the 3000 warehouses that we looked at that were over 100,000 square feet in the IE in Southern California, 80% of those are in communities of color, 80%. And over 600 schools in our community are half a mile from a warehouse. And just to like put that into perspective, right? That is kids walking to and from school with diesel trucks driving right next to them. And that's not safe for kids. That's not safe for parents. That's not safe for the drivers who are forced to navigate the streets when they're already working, right? This also boils down to health costs that I know we don't think about too many times because it's not just the asthma medication. It's also finding an asthma specialist. It's finding the right type of doctor for the asthma that your, that your kids might have. And, and they do this because they want their kids to be able to run track and play soccer without having to hold their inhaler in, which is a common thing when you live in communities that are over polluted. Um, and this problem is still growing. The fix isn't just to have everyone stop online shopping. It's really to create a system of moving goods that's for everybody. And right now, what we learned from the study is that zip codes consuming the less are the ones that have the most warehouses set in them and vice versa, right? Zip codes that are consuming the most don't have any Amazon warehouses in them. Um, and electric trucks is a big part of that solution. But I really want to point out this, which is really important to us, which is not just the environmental, environmental mitigation that we need. We are also the workers in the community. You know, this is the main industry in our community logistics. And our families are the truckers or the warehouse workers that make all of this possible and are deserving of the dignified work that it is. And the workers are community members and vice versa. So our fight is not one dimensional. So when we're thinking about improving the industry in our communities, it's not just cut the diesel out. It's also address the rampant wage theft, the unsafe working conditions, the ridiculous body breaking quota, the misclassification that this industry is notorious for. So when we enter policy fights, we enter it with this idea that we want to build power, not just to switch technology, but to build power for our workers and for our community so that they have more control over the quality of their own life and the quality of their own work. And we know that we believe if we get electric trucks, we're going to clean up the pollution. But if we still have an industry that cheats its workers, we do not win, right? And we're not going to win this fight against climate change if we still keep undercutting workers in our community. And, you know, there's this created history of how like EJ and workers are against each other, but it's, it's totally created, right? Because they know that when, when our communities come together, we are the most powerful. And so that was really important when we entered the ACT fight and the ACF fight, we really wanted to make sure that when we entered these fights, we were reaching into the dimensions of our community members in all their dimensions. Um, and I will say, right, the, the ACF rule was about getting trucks out of our communities, and it, and it still is. And what we did was we engaged community members in this conversation about, well, how many trucks are in your community? And we did truck counts, and we found that there was like over a thousand, you know, right by their school or right by their park. And every time CARB would create this iteration of the advancing truck rule, we would take it back to them and say, does this reflect what we see? Because if CARB isn't creating a rule that reflects what we see, then the policy isn't good enough. The policy has to address lived experiences, or if not, maybe we should stop creating a problem that policy can't fix, right? And so I will say CARB gave us some really low numbers and we doubled it, you know, we doubled it. So we were asking for a triple. So the work still continues. And I think we were able to get as far as we did with the advancing triple because we were centering community and worker voices this whole time. And as we enter into the advancing fleet rule, we're working on this, we're going in with that same mentality. How do we create a policy that really represents what's happening on the ground? So I'll, I'll leave it there and pass it on to the next person. 
Thank you so much, Andrea. That was so powerful. Um, next, we will be closing out this panel with Ricardo Hidalgo with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Ricardo? Thank you, Destiny. Um, and Andrea, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. A thousand percent, you're, you're, actually, you're accurate. Um, and, you know, folks, what, some of the things that I just, you know, want to clear the air as well that, you know, people think that labor and environmentalists or environmental justice folks uh, were at odds. And, and that's, that's could be the furthest from the truth. Um, you know, I've had the, the privilege and the pleasure to, to work out here with in, in Los Angeles and Long Beach um, and various other ports as well throughout the country for the last uh, at, at least 14 years. But the, the, the problem didn't start there. And we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to make sure people completely understand that the Teamsters Union is completely behind the electrification of trucks in the state of California, uh, as long as, right, that the, the cost and the maintenance, the burden of that, of, of all that goes on the backs of these trucking companies that employ these women and, and men that drive these trucks every single day. We've already seen um, a lot of mistakes that were made down in the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach with the first clean trucks program and the way they rolled out, you know, LNG trucks and diesel particulates and all these other filters and, and just, you know, things that, that were, were positive to, to start cleaning the air, uh, but negative in every aspect when all that was 100% put on the backs of these men and women that don't, that, that don't have the, the economic uh, uh, ability to, to, to purchase, let alone maintain. Uh, but I just, I just want to make sure folks that, that we are 100% behind this. Um, and, and going back to what I mentioned about when this started, um, you know, this started to, in our opinion, back back in 1980 when the, when the trucking industry was deregulated and mm -hmm. allowed trucking companies and the industries and the beneficial cargo owners to invent the facade of this independent contractor. There, it doesn't exist in, in, in I would say 99% of the drivers in the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach are not independent contractors. They're just misclassified. Um, and, and that's what opened the, the door uh, to really just allow this to happen. But, but good news, folks, and I don't want to get too much into it, but um, I've heard some of you folks might have heard about the AB5 policy that was passed uh, a couple years back. Well, uh, the trucking industry uh, opposed it, challenged it, and it was enjoined. But we just got the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals come back today and say it's not, it's not um, preempted by the F quadruple A. So, you know, the good thing is we're winning in, 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 in every battle. It's just taking a little bit more time. So one of the things and we've been, you know, collaborating with, with our environmental groups on, on this advanced fleet, fleet rule because it's important that we set the tone, set the standards, and CARB has to listen. They have to, they have to listen to us uh, because, you know, we, I would say we, because we're speaking on behalf of working class men and women, right, the environmental groups, uh, environmental communities that, that are really being uh, just struck by this pollution, when in the end, it's, it's the targets, it's the Amazons, it's the, it's the Costco's, it's the, the they're, they're the ones benefiting and making all the money and us Californians are the ones sacrificing. So what, you know, what we're trying to do really is just address some of the key issues um, on, on this, uh, through this advanced fleet, fleet rule to make sure that any subsidies, any, any monies, anything that, that is, has, goes to, um, through this and other policies to really make sure that the burden falls 100% on the trucking companies and, and, and or the, 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 the beneficial cargo owners, right? It should not be the drivers. Um, we've already seen what happens. I'm gonna give you some anecdotal information. here. So we had one driver uh, some years back that uh, he, he had his brand new LNG truck. And because in the first month it spent three weeks in, in, at the dealership because <laughs> it wasn't you know, working, uh, he quickly found out that the best thing for him, he changed his LNG truck back to a diesel truck, although it was subsidized, uh, and kept on trucking. Uh, so that's one example. Another example is one of these diesel particulate filters, uh, which costs a lot of money, right? I, I, I don't remember how much it costs, but I know a driver told me he put it off to at least six months uh, longer than he, he drove with it six months longer because he couldn't afford it, right? And, and these are just some of the things, and let alone... Right, some of the other safety issues because I don't know if you've seen some of the tires that they drive on because they don't have the money for that. If they don't have the money to buy a, a two hundred dollar tire, right? How are they going to buy a three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar electric truck, even with mm. you know all the subsidies in the world? 
So th these are just some of the examples that are happening on the ground, right? That sometimes people at, in Sacramento don't see, right? No different to what Andrea said. These communities, uh, I for one am from these communities. I, I grew up three, three miles from the, from, the, from the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, right? And, and these are our communities. When you talk about these drivers, they live in these same communities. However, it's, it's just completely wrong that not only do they have to suffer and sacrifice with their own kids and their own family and themselves in the air that they're bringing in these communities, but they're also being, you know, you're gonna pay for help and cleaning it up. So, you know, to us, it's more about working together in partnership uh, to really address these issues, to really uh, push back, uh, because at the end of the day, we all know who's, who's benefiting and we all know who's sacrificing. So, you know, on the behalf of the Teamsters, I just wanna make sure people are, are very clear that we're gonna do whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes to make sure we hold this companies, these companies, this industry accountable, accountable because that's what it's gonna take. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Ricardo. And thank you everyone for sharing all of this great information and for the incredible work that you're doing for our state. We will now move to the Q&A portion and we have some great questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, are there legislative efforts underway to force all EV charging networks to serve all brands of EV? And I'm going to direct this question for you, Ruben. Uh, I think there is a CEC process to do that, but I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. I know it's a problem and I know there's gonna be a, at least a requirement to have point of purchase uh, abilities, right, so that you can use credit card at all the charging for light duty. Um, for medium and heavy duty, this is less of a concern um, because, uh, you know, trucking interests are going to be coordinating with uh, the utilities and the, um, you know, charging infrastructure to make sure it's all compatible, um, you know, from point to point use. But that is a real problem on the light duty side. Um, and I'm not fully familiar of, of all of the fixes to make sure that a mature marketplace works as easily as a gas station does today, which it needs to. Thank you. So our next question, this one is for Ricardo. What are your thoughts on expansion in the Central Valley in regards to, in regards to fleet warehouses? Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, so this industry, uh, for lack of better words, just takes from Peter to pay Paul. So they just relocate the, 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 the emissions, they just, uh, the, the pollution, they just take it from, you know, maybe a, f a little bit of it from Andrea's community, right, in, in the Inland Empire, right, and take it up to the, to the Central Valley. You know, we, we know of quite a few warehouses uh, in the Central Valley, in the Southern Central Valley area, that serve as, as, as hubs for this port stuff, right? So these, these drivers are hauling, right? Usually just one load a day, right? But that, that pollution is, is, is coming and going from the harbors to the Central Valley every single day, every single day. And, and I don't want anybody to, to misinterpret, right? Being in California who we are, 40% of all the goods that come in and out of this country are coming through the dual ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. That doesn't take into account even Oakland. Right, which is an addition, I think 5%. So point being is there's a lot of goods coming in and out of California. We are the Mecca when it comes to the rest of this country. And that's obviously gonna bring excess pollution and, and through every community. And, and companies like ProLogix that are like uh, logistical warehousing property acquire acquisitioners and all this stuff, they, they like uh, working with the state and getting subsidies to promote all these new warehouse and jobs. All they're doing is bringing pollution into the different uh, areas, Central Valley being one of them. Thank you, Ricardo. Our next question will be um, for Andrea. Andrea, this question comes from Theodore Randolph. He asks, as we clean certain locations, how do we make sure the people can benefit? In my city, we are cleaning up pollution and investing in transit along the real estate development, which is a good thing, but the development is being carefully managed to ensure the housing shortage and office space shortage continue indefinitely, which is a bad thing. And the benefits do not go to existing communities in those locations. How do we move to politics of abundance? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a tough question. I think we get a lot of that too, where we're forced to choose between like jobs or clean air. And we're always forced, like we have a scarcity mindset in our cities. Um, and something that we've been doing locally is trying to really build on, or, or try to, sh two ways, right? right? Showing like kind of like the model that the cities are using now and bringing in, you know, logistics that they could pay for sidewalks and we can pay for infrastructure costs. Like what are all of the cons that also come to that? Because right now they're super focused on, well, this is bringing in sidewalks and we need sidewalks, right? And, and like, that's like the biggest thing that's important to us right now. And so we are trying to find alternative ways of saying, well, you can also get the money for it doing this, right? Or doing that. Um, we have been involved in some community benefits agreements campaigns locally, uh, both on commercial buildings and also for industrial buildings. We're trying to kind of change the, the paradigm or like change the culture here. We're like, we're asking for so little. I think the cities really need to understand how valuable the land is land is not only for the people that are there working it, but also for the location of it. Um, so that's been one of the strategies we've been using, but it's, it's something that is really tough, Theodore, and we, we, we run into it a lot. Thank you so much for that, Andrea. So we still have several questions, um, but for sake of time, um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. So we've, we've heard a lot of great um, information and programs and, and so much um, today. And really, I feel that what we need is a multi-pronged uh, strategy that addresses access and inclusion. We are in the 21st year now in a row that California has had the most polluted air in the country. It's ridiculous. Transportation needs to be sustainable it needs to be clean and it needs to be equitable for everyone. It is not monolithic as we've heard the many solutions from our panelists that they have shared today. So I am going to go ahead and pass it to Duran so he can share ways that you can take action right now. Duran. Thank you so much, uh, Destiny. And thank you to all the panelists, Andrea, Ricardo and Ruben. Uh, you guys are all awesome, and we really applaud the work that you're all doing and for your clear and articulate presentations here today. Um, I do want to also make a point of thanking all of you who are in attendance here today, as well as our whole team here at the Climate Center. Thank you, Destiny, for your work. But we've got some stuff for you to do, because it's not enough to just, uh, you know, watch a webinar and, you know, pound our fists on the table, but we have an opportunity to take action. So I'm going to ask my, my colleague, Nina, uh, who's working behind the scenes here today, to drop a couple more links into the chat. First, this is our take action item for today. A take action item for today is to do exactly what we've all been talking about. Put pressure on the legislature to make the necessary investments in clean air. As we know, the legislature is in the middle of its budget process. Um, and so we, this is a really great time for you to let those folks know uh, that you care about equity in transportation. We need clean car investments now uh, because 98% of Californians are living in a region earning an F grade for air quality, something that Joe knows a lot about. Uh, electric vehicles will save over $1,000 per year per family. Um, there are some great programs. Uh, my colleague Davis uh, down in Stockton pointed out that they've got this mobility collective project, seven and a half million dollars to promote electric cars and bikes, workforce development, and the other things that we all care about. So we want you to contact your legislator and let them know that clean mobility is something that we need to invest in, we need to invest in now. Ruben referred to this. Um, if you go to the link that we just sent you to take action today, you have two choices. You can do one and or both. You can tweet at your representatives. You can simply retweet the tweet that we've placed and we're hoping that a lot of you will just go to the retweet link and retweet the link to your representatives. In particular, please hashtag Assemblymember Ting, Richard Bloom, Bob Bukowski, Senator Durazo, and Nancy Skinner. That information is all in the link that we sent you. Uh, and those are the people who are key on the budget committees uh, because we need to fund clean transportation, equitable drink, clean transportation. Uh, there's uh, proposals to put $200 million into equity projects, $300 million into clean trucks and buses. 
this needs to happen. You can also pick up the phone and call these people. And we provided the phone numbers for you. If you have an extra minute, please call. There's a script there. Uh, these actions are essential. We need to make sure that the legislature hears our voices uh, loud and clear. Again, this is all part of Climate Safe California. I notice we now have uh, you know, close to two dozen new endorsements. Uh, Nina, if you wouldn't mind dropping that link in one more time for endorsing Climate Safe California. I think uh, some of you have already done that, but if you have not, please capture that link and consider doing it. You can endorse as an individual. You can also endorse as an organization. So if you work for a business or for a nonprofit or for a city council, uh, please consider bringing it to your board or to your leadership team and joining other cities and counties, uh, businesses, nonprofits uh, who are part of this 1100 member strong endorser, endorsers of Climate Safe California, which is the signature program of the Climate Center. So uh, once again, the Climate Center welcomes you, uh, thanks you for being here. I'd also take, uh, like to take one more moment just to thank all of our sponsors one more time, Renewable America, Enphase, Jackson Family Wines, Bay Area Air Quality Management District, thank you, Tin, for being here, Soylent Company, Willow Creek Wealth Management, MCE, Peninsula Clean Energy, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, Sunrun, Terra Verde Energy, and River City Bank, all part of our growing coalition. I want to let you all know that we'll be sending you a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar, so you'll be able to, uh, to share that with others. Uh, I also want to encourage you to sign up for our next webinar on May 25th on the topic of natural sequestration. Uh, no matter what we do to remove emissions from our transportation and energy sector, uh, it, we're not going to be able to get to zero emissions. That's why we talk about net negative. And in order to do that, we need to sequester more carbon in natural and working lands. Turns out that that is highly doable. A Jackson Family Wines, Strauss Family Creamery, and some of the other members of the Climate Center Business Network are already working on these specific issues and are coming up with solutions. We're going to be talking about all of that uh, during our next webinar on May 25th. So we very much hope you'll sign up for that. Registration is now open. I want to thank the 200 people who joined us here today. All of you who are still on the call. I want to emphasize, we don't just thank you for attending this webinar. We thank you for being part of a growing movement across California, uh, calling for climate justice and calling for more accelerated climate actions. Lastly, one more time, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Joe and Tin, Ruben, uh, Lillian, Ricardo, and Andrea. Uh, all of you are doing amazing work. We applaud what you're doing every single day. We look forward to continuing to work together. Uh, and I see we're actually gonna end about a minute early, which is fantastic. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Steve, uh, and all of the attendees. Thank you to all the speakers, uh, and uh, you're very welcome. And thank you to all our speakers. Uh, let's get back to work. Climate Safe California, we can do this. Look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar. Thank you all very much.